GDP Armageddon happened. It was really scary. They said the world was gonna blow up. Were you all there? I was there. It was a scary time. Um, it's the hottest topic, right? Everyone's like, privacy, it's a thing. Everyone's like super excited, right? Yeah? No? <laughs> uh, it actually is a really, really important topic. Um, a lot of what we do already encounters the topic surrounding privacy. We've been thinking about this for a very, very long time. We just haven't been using the words. We haven't been thinking about it as it incorporates to our design. And today, uh, Kevin and I are going to be spending some time talking about what privacy actually means. Um, as you just heard, Kevin works at Automatic. I work at XWP. Um, and originally, we we're going to have Ryan Kinney, who's a lawyer who uh, helped make this talk, be here today. Some things happened, and she can't be here, but that's okay. Um, we're not lawyers. This is not legal advice, but this was reviewed by a lawyer, which is pretty cool. Um, so we are not lawyers. lawyers. That's very important, and this is not legal <laughs> advice. But you don't need to be a lawyer to care about privacy. In fact, privacy is for everyone, not just the lawyers. Um, so GDPR is the big topic of the year, but we're not going to be talking too specifically about um, GDPR today, uh, nor are we going to talk too specifically about particular implementations for your website or tell you how to design your checkboxes, as fun as that might be. Uh, because focusing on the GDPR and um, one regulation is a little bit small, a little bit myopic, when privacy is a much more all-encompassing topic. And also, the GDPR is just the latest of privacy regulation um, that has a big impact. Uh, understandably, it got a lot of attention, got a lot of people um, looking into it, probably because of the penalty mechanisms and the big fine numbers. Um, but it actually isn't a uh, new or a uh, dramatic change, at least if you talk to the privacy regulators and the people who wrote the legislation. It's designed to be an evolution, not a revolution. Uh, and in laws, there are a lot of existing laws in Europe, all over Europe. And the GDPR was designed to update them a little bit, but mainly like harmonize them. Um, so there are a lot of laws, which you can see here, um, that should have been in effect and should have been followed uh, for a long time. Consistency and clarity. Consistency and clarity, right. Um, and then over here on this side of the pond, there actually is a lot of privacy law as well. Um, and some of it's, you know, a little, some of it's a little outdated and it dates back to the phones of the early teens. Uh, but there is lots of different laws and the way that uh, privacy has been regulated so far in the United States is very industry specific um, and very like specific case, to specific to different kind of case, use cases. Um, so you have, um, you know, the Can Spam Act about, you know, email newsletters, you have, you know, COPPA about children, you have particular regulations for running a college or education or medical, you probably all had to sign HIPAA notices online or off. And so all those apply to businesses as well. Um, and there's like a lot of laws in California where a lot of technology firms are based. Uh, so that regulates all those privacy policies and those check boxes and those things that you agree to, which um, may not have gotten as much news or attention as the GDPR, but has, you know, for years led to fines, enforcement actions, lawsuits, settlements. So um, privacy is not new and we shouldn't look at just one little piece of it. Um, we'd like to look at all of it. Um, but, and uh, furthermore, there will probably be more privacy legislation uh, in the U.S. Um, in this year, the, California passed a pretty ambitious GDPR-like um, uh, legislation called the CCPA, uh, which will go into effect on you know, some large businesses in 2020. Uh, will probably be amended before then. Um, and there is actually a pretty decent chance that the new Congress will take up some federal privacy legislation in sort of the mold of GDPR. Um, so that's a lot to think about if you're running a website. How do you grasp onto all of those different things? Um, and the way we think you should approach it is to not think about any particular jurisdiction, any particular law. Just start out with the strongest possible privacy practices that you can build into your site and your business. And if you start from that place, then it'll be much easier to adapt to whatever laws get passed now in the future or to your particular jurisdiction or to your particular industry. So you should have some privacy practices baked into what you do all the time. And then if you have you know, a new client and health or with like a weird legislation in Brazil or something, you'll be able to easily adapt to that and carve out exceptions, things like that. Um, if you focus on just the strongest possibly privacy uh, practices to begin with that are kind of common among all legislation. So what are some of the common areas? Um, the GDPR, as it was like harmonizing and clarifying um, existing law, actually has a nice section on principles. It's like, here are the data protection principles from existing law. Um, and you can see 
this is actually the shortened version. Uh, you know, lawfulness, fitness, transparency. It's too much. Minimization, limitation, confidentiality. Too much. Um, you can read it if you want. It's not bad, but it's very confusing when you get from that to like, okay, how do I put that into a website or, you know, into my WordPress? Um, so let's boil that down a little farther into plain language. And um, these are kind of the, I'm glossing over some particulars here, definitely. Again, not legal advice. But these are the, these are the common ways we think you should approach privacy. Um, one is to be the transparent about the data you collect and why. Um, that's actually easier said than done. You might not know all the data that you're collecting using third-party tools where that data goes. Um, you need to look at, look at it and figure it out. And to be transparent means that the people who are using your site, your customers, your visitors, they should be able, if they want to, to understand what you're doing with their data as well. And that doesn't mean you can just throw an opt-in checkbox on everything. Um, opt-in is just one of the legal basis you can use um, to be transparent with your uh, customers about data. And some people might think it's kind of the lowest common denominator. Like just because you got a checked opt-in doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with people's data. Um, you need to think more holistically, like are they going to understand it? Or are they going to have some transparency and control there? Um, another big principle is to get only the data you need and to don't store that data any longer than necessary. Um, and that's another thing that's easier said than done. Uh, internet technology makes it amazingly easy to collect lots of data. And you know, just by like, you know, pulling in a library or implementing any code or putting a little plug in here or there. Uh, but it's actually better to think about what all are they doing, why, and do you really need it? So if you start from collecting only the data you need, It'll make all your compliance efforts a lot easier, and it's actually a requirement of a lot of privacy legislation that you have a good reason. Uh, and if you are asked or questioned, um, you will need to know what's the reason for it. So it's good to figure it out and make sure, hey, do I really need it? Um, and you may have you know, legacy code from years ago, and you're not even sure that it didn't even know that it did something. If you can justify everything, though, you'll be well on your way to being safe. Um, and then you have to keep that data safe, especially if you have sensitive personal data, you know, social security numbers or things that could be cobbled together to be, make a sensitive profile on someone. Even if you have great privacy practices, if you don't have great security practices, it's kind of a moot point and you can still get in trouble. Um, and the very last thing is to be accountable um, to your users. Did it go away? All right. Um, be accountable to your users, um, which means if they want to access data, if they have questions, you should be able to answer them. If they want to delete or update things, um, they are your constituent, they're your boss a little bit um, under privacy law, and so you should be accountable to them. And if you're accountable to them, it'll make it a lot easier to be accountable to regulators if you meet the circumstance where you run into a regulator. Luckily, a few people do, but if you're accountable and uh, up forthright, then you'll be well on your way. And undergirding kind of all of these is you should write all of this down. Um, every, that's um, both a statutory requirement and just practically it makes everything you're doing easier. Um, so, you know, if asked, a privacy regulator will probably want to see your privacy policies and your justifications of things. Um, and also, maybe users would like to know as well, um, but it'll also make it easier for you um, to, once you start writing things down, all those other ones about being transparent and getting only the data you need, the practice of writing it down helps you answer all those questions. Aren't you supposed to tell your users what you're supposed to do with their data? <laughs> um, yes, you are supposed to tell your users what you do with their data, um, but you don't necessarily want to overwhelm them with every last detail because then they're not going to understand. So you want some internal and external documentation. Really, the more you can write down, the better. Um, if you take nothing else away from this talk, go home and write uh, like a plan or some outline of what you're doing with data and what your plans are. Um, so, what does that mean for your site? Uh, well, I can't really tell you <laughs> because every site is different, every business is different, every constituency is different. Um, you know, a, a bank, you know, a ski resort, a cowboy hat maker, a coffee shop, a doctor's office. In 2018, all these are really internet businesses, uh, but they all have different customers with different needs and different relevant uh, legislation. And your customers understand things in different ways. Um, you know, if I go to the coffee shop and give them my credit card, I don't expect them to hand me, like, permission to ask the credit card company to, you know, some personal data if it's a fraudulent charge. So you need to pick what's appropriate for you and your customers. Um, and that's easier said than done. That's why you can't just, unfortunately, can't just download a plugin. I can't tell you to go just get this thing from the repository, run it on your site, and privacy is all done. Um, we can only help you ask the right questions, and you're going to need to come up with the answers for yourselves, for each, um, 
each site and business um, that you work on. And um, the last uh, real point we want to make about this is privacy is a process. Um, it's not something that um, you attain, it's something that you maintain. It's a practice that you do every day through everything that you do. You can't just do it once and forget it. You need to continually do it and build it into a process. Um, and that's the way that you truly protect privacy for the long term and are ready for any legislation or regulation that comes your way. Uh, which is important because there really is a rising tide of regulation uh, for tech, uh, not just in privacy, but in kind of every area of what we do. And we just need to be ready for it. Um, and if you have good processes, you will be ready for it. Um, also, we want to ask, well, why do we care? <laughs> um, we don't care just because we want to avoid lawyers or fines or breaking laws, all those are, although those are very good things. Uh, but privacy is actually good. It makes your products better, makes clients happy, it makes your customers trust you more, um, as well as reducing your uh, legal liability. Um, and you'll see that in every little piece along the way that, you, um, that we're going to look at today. Um, I also want to editorialize a little bit and say it's really key to the open web. Um, the closed web is not built with privacy by default. But if you go back all the way back to like the early days of free software getting started, pre-internet popularity, uh, autonomy of the end user was always a big goal, was always central. You know, the four freedoms of software, freedom number one is um, the freedom to study how the program works and change it to make it do what you wish. Well, for you, you place program with website in that, it's pretty close to a robust and user-centric privacy policy. So if we care about the open web and WordPress, and I think everyone in this room does, we should really, really care about making sure that our privacy practices are good and that we make these uh, beautiful principles of open source uh, real and visible to the end users and to the customers in a way that they can understand so that they know that, hey, the open web is better than the closed web that tries to suck up all my data and control and exploit as much as I can. I like open web because it puts me in control. Um, and you do that, again, not by a single thing, but uh, having privacy by design is the buzzword from legislation from the GDPR. Put it in all of your process, all of your design. Um, it's not just what your web developers do. It's what your customer support does. It's what your documentation looks like. It's you know, what your business people do day to day. So you need to design it into everything. Um, it doesn't have to stop or take over everything. It's just everyone needs to think a little bit, how do I design? what I'm doing day to day for privacy. It's legally required under GDPR to have some showable way that you've designed privacy into your system and will probably be in other legislation going forward. Plus, it just makes sense and makes your products better. Um, but how you do that in particular, um, Leo is gonna go over that in a good uh, operation life cycle, keeping that process going. So privacy. It's a big topic. It sounds scary. I promise it's as easy as four things. And really, like, one thing, mostly protection, but we'll get there. Um, why, as Americans, do we care about privacy? Like, all we care about is free speech. Like, that's, like, the fundamental blockers to everything else. We're like, well, free speech matters more than anything else, and everyone's got to have their free speech. The practice is sometimes the way that privacy is constructed in terms of legal frameworks, in terms of technology, can come at the cost of this. Um, we're seeing quite a big trend uh, across the ecosystem as people move toward a more universal understanding of how these things mean. Um, and if you look at the difference to the way that Europe views these things, uh, the idea that privacy is a fundamental human right, we have the ability to opt out of things. Communication should be open and protected, but we have personal abilities to be be quiet, be private, to ignore, to opt out. This is the trend we're seeing across the entire ecosystem. This difference is why we may feel that tension. It's why you may not feel like this is a big deal to you, but this is actually something that is core and critical. Um, and you'll see that uh, as we start to break into this actual life cycle, chances are you're probably doing a lot of these things. Um, if you're a developer, a lot of this is gonna feel quite familiar to you, um, but you also see there's a lot of gaps probably. Um, and you'll, you'll see that quite a bit of this is about how you can reflect on this process. So in the assess phase, uh, there's a lot of maturity that you need to recognize inside. Uh, what are you actually collecting? You need to stop and recognize at the very base level who you are, what you do, why you do it, and why do you even collect data in the first place? Does this actually help your business? And once you have a good lay of the land, you're like, okay, this is how I approach things. We can then start to move into a more appropriate phase where we can respond to the way data works inside our platforms. 
So in the protect phase, we actually start to unpack and understand the entire platforms that we work with, the tools we work with. Um, and the main tool that we work with, because we're at a WordCamp, is probably WordPress, right? But that's probably not the only tool. Um, the laws don't care about WordPress. The laws care about the entire ecosystem. They, they care about business requirements. They care about how we respond to the needs of the ecosystem as a whole. They say, you have to follow your contracts. You need to have these agreements. You need to follow cookie laws. You need to be able to understand third-party agreements. You need to have privacy policies. These are things that you actually have to do. Um, as you understand what these things mean, it's best to plan way ahead so that you don't actually have to deal with a lawsuit. You have minimal exposure by default. Um, there's a great quote that I came across uh, that sort of thinks about how you might be doing this already. So this is about uh, an ad publisher who uh, spent some time unpacking like how they wanted to respond to GDPR. But really, this is just about privacy as a whole. We've heard of publishers simply turning off EU traffic or ins to ensure that they won't run afoul of GDPR, on the other hand, of a spectrum, just burying their hands in the sand, doing nothing. Mediavine is not interested in either extreme. We take user privacy very seriously, but what content creators to build sustainable businesses as well, especially in the event that this experiment ever extends beyond the EU, right now a very small percentage of most publishers' traffic, we want to make sure, as always, that Mediavine and its publishers are prepared for an ever-changing landscape. Right? Like, that to me is cool. Like they have found a way that is bridging those two ideas, free speech and free privacy all together. You have the ability to opt out of these things. Um, and as we start to march forward, we're gonna see this trend happen. Um, so what does that actually mean? It means that legally you need to be reading these things. So once you've read things and these things look good, you probably have a developer, an engineer, uh, an architect is what we call them, an XWP. That person then gets this set of requirements. You're like, okay, so what do we do? This is all quite complicated. Um, well, it's probably security related. Um, PSA, this is now gonna turn into security talk for the next like 15 minutes. But this is actually a really critical thing to understand. Security has a lot of overlap with how privacy actually works when the rubber meets the road. So base zero, um, raise your hand here if you have a site that does not have SSL. Anyone gonna admit to it? That's okay. That's a requirement. Every single site should have SSL. Um, and even if you can, HSTS. Things like permissions. If you don't know how permissions work in your databases, or sorry, your, uh, your file systems, this is critical. Uh, data backups are, are really important. You should be testing your backups. You should be maintaining backups for a very long time. These are records of how these things work. You can compare two backups and understand what's happened from then to, to that point. Um, you should be having source control as part of what you do. The minute you include things like Git to your workflow, you enable CI CD pipelines. All of this allows us to really start to think of the future out of the box for these other tools that we'll get into in just a few minutes. And also, of course, staging, which you've probably heard many times at other work camps about. This is a requirement to be able to do these things right, to have the right testing as a baseline. And of course, things like two-factor authentication, IP filtering, and secure passwords. These are things that are required. Uh, if, if you don't have 2FA, if you don't have a secure password on all your sensitive things, leave this talk right now, go outside the hall, and do it. <laughs> uh, that's like more important than anything that um, we're talking about. Uh, and if your host uh, or your providers don't offer 2FA in good security practices and SSL, find new hosts, find new third-party providers. And to be fair, we're arguing for best practices. So if you're not quite there yet, this is where you should be obtaining to. Um, I strongly feel the same way. There's a lot of reasons why we can do this better. And once you start here, we can get into some of the interesting nuances that go from here. So this is from the developer handbook on the section around section, uh, security. And I have to call out my favorite XQCD car uh, cartoon. This is the story of little Bobby Tables. I'm sure everyone knows the story of Bobby Tables. Uh, so Robert Drop Table students, uh, who you know eliminates the records from the school. Um, in practice, you should never assume that any data is going to be safe. You should never assume anything about a data platform, and you should never become complacent. Right? This sounds like the fundamental principles of democracy and software development, right? It really should be. Um, and this is actually how we should be approaching security. It's how we should be approaching privacy. We should be trying to make sure that we can respond to this. And this sounds a little fuzzy and a little like crazy, angry in the corner, but that's actually how we need to respond to these things. So in practice, how do we do the thing? This means as you unpack data streams, APIs, software, functions, look at these things, understand what they mean. And if something looks too complicated, ask yourself if there's a way to make it simpler. Uh, and even as you start to ask basic questions, if you're not a developer and you're, you just have a contact form, you have a bunch of questions on this contact form, do you need to ask someone their birth date or their name or their phone number or their social security number? Or can you just get their email address? Or does it, is their email address even necessary? 
um, you can abstract the kinds of questions that you ask so you never even have exposure to begin with. Um, and that's actually part of these things that we should be thinking about. Um, additionally, uh, you should only be working as much data as, as needed. So a couple years ago, I was working on a project with the school's API data. And as we unpacked all this data, it was like, I can see social security numbers and birth dates and cities and I can get all these transcripts. So what we had to do to prevent any kind of exposure is server-side rendering of that API and then watering down that API to only make certain things available. That's the responsibility you should be moving toward. Otherwise, you're going to accidentally expose yourself if the wrong things happen. Um, and of course, I'm not going to get too much in the weeds of this, but all data that coming in and out of your browser should be cleaned. You have responsibilities. If you know about escaping and sanitizing, great. Double down on it. If you use core functions, they probably do this right. If you're not sure, look up the source code. WordPress's source code is open source. You can look on Track, you can look on GitHub, it's all there. Um, there are definitely lots of things there that get into the weeds here that describe what this is supposed to look like. Um, if you're not comfortable with it, so for example, like if you're worried that some random JavaScript that you're calling in is not gonna do what you want it to do, escape it, check it, make sure it can't do the things you don't want it to do. Um, and more critically, don't trust anyone. Like, I don't trust anyone. Yeah. Would you give someone your house key? Would you give someone your car keys? Would you give someone your root password? Would you give someone a pem file? What would you do, right? Uh, I love this comic too, it's another XKCD one. Like, you know, this pseudo incident is reported and Santa Claus is keeping a naughty list, right? The, you really need to get, at, at the end of the day, an understanding of who has access to things. So whatever your keys are, whether this is like a master email that you guys all share, uh, maybe this is, um, a list of super admin passwords or uh, Google app suite, whatever that is, keep that number as small as possible. So if you can do this in the protective stage, a lot of the concerns you have might be able to be mitigated by default. And this also goes a couple steps further. As you start to build into your workflows, ideally if you're a developer or you're working with developers, you should be asking questions that surround these things. So if you aren't already, you should be comparing your code to coding standards, so ESLint, uh, PHPCS, WPCS. And if you're not using a standards code editor, which I really hope everyone is, you should be. And uh, the four code editors that I called out here, all of these have tools that are built into the browser that check for code that breaks, that check for standards that, don't, that aren't met. Um, there's quite a bit of energy around this that is critical to unpack why your stuff isn't working or why your stuff may not actually meet basic security requirements that don't meet basic privacy requirements. Additionally, going a couple steps further, this work extends into the whole ecosystem because we're not in a vacuum. Our sites are across many, many platforms. If WordPress is a third of the internet, this means that your site is going to look like someone else's. But how much better or how much worse are you in comparison to someone else's? So you need to lean on tools like Tide, HTT Archive, Lighthouse that actually start to unpack some of these requirements at scale so you can understand how you're reflecting these things. Um, additionally, you can spend some time getting into uh, other validation services. So there's a couple tools like uh, Code Climate and uh, CodeBeat that as a service will provide code validation. So if you want to prevent for deployment code shipping out that may have met for whatever reason certain pieces, you can still have multiple guardrails that say no more bad code shipping even to staging. Um, even further, you should probably be reading the manual to everything. We spend a lot of time writing documentation around code. So if you write plugins, you write themes, you write components, you write modules, you're probably writing something about it. And so if someone has written something, take the time to read it. Chances are we probably have explained all the problems to this stuff already. And if you're using dependencies, which you probably are, or you're using software that has dependencies, know what they do. And as you start to build into these things, understand what these things mean at scale. So uh, as you start to get into this, you will recognize that things will fail. So what does um, reading... And, uh, if I may, if you're not a coder, that's a lot of code stuff. If you're not a coder, you can do something very similar to that, which is um, go and look at the documentation of the plugins and third-party services you use and see if you can understand what they're doing your, with your data and where it goes. Get out a piece of paper, draw a little map. And if there's something that you don't understand from their manual, ask the service. And if they're a good service, they should be able to answer your questions the way, in a, somewhat in a way that you can understand. Not that you need to know every single database call, but that you have some idea of what data you're sending in and getting back and what's done with it and if it's safe. Yeah, 
Thank you for that. The this in practice, like we literally launched a plugin release yesterday at WordCamp US, and PHP 7.3 came out, and no other software came out yesterday. I promise. Don't read the news. Um, so we also shipped a product site for our plugin, which is super cool. And we wrote a bunch of technical documentation, but we also wrote documentation for end users. Like we really want people to understand this stuff, so they want to use it. That's a basic requirement. It can look like a website. Sometimes it doesn't look like a website. Sometimes it's uh, stuff that sits inside a composer library that can be viewed on a place like Packagist. Uh, and that's sometimes not even available, right? So in the work, case of the WordPress project, a lot of things are written strictly inline as doc blocks. So if you can't find something, look in the places that you think they might be. And if they don't exist, ask someone why they don't exist. Keep prodding. Someone wrote this code to begin with. You should try to get it and understand why these things exist and the way they're supposed to. So plugins, modules, codes, themes, okay, a lot of stuff. Why are we using them? That's really the, the point here. If you're going to use these things, understand what they do. And as you start to look at them, you should be asking questions. Are they simple and straightforward? Are they well scoped? Or are they huge? Are they well supported? Are they widely adopted? Are they well documented? Um, if they're not, maybe you should consider using a different plugin. Maybe you should choose one that maybe have a, has a better version of that exact piece to it. And if you have the engineering supports, it makes sense to spend time looking at the, at the source code closely, to actually read the documentation and to actually consider what's actually there. Um, I would urge, at least in this current state of things, to be really considerate about not auto-updating. Not auto-updating plugins and really understanding what diffs look like. For some people, you might have different appendices on this exact fact, but if you actually have the, the resources, you can start to break these things. Additionally, you should probably be testing code. Um, if you really do care about what things look like at scale, you probably have lots of tools to do this for you, or you might have a host that works with you to do this. Uh, additionally, you can do this with integrations as we talked about before. So, okay, always understanding stuff. What does this actually look like when it goes wrong? Well, things break. So uh, NPM had a bunch of packages that started doing things they weren't supposed to. Started taking the ability to call home and doing weird things. That's weird, right? You should ask what this thing does and whether we need it. Um, and you might have opinions. I know like uh, the classic discussions around NPM packages has been a long, long piece to it, uh, to what we do. Um, this is also a question around plugins that we choose as, as a whole. If you don't use the official plugin, right? So in the case of the AMP plugin that I was working on the last year or so, there was a plugin that has almost the same name that had a major security vulnerability. We don't do that. We spend a lot of time focusing on how to make our things better. We have an entirely different approach. We don't have to do emergency releases. We have an entirely different approach. If you know that there might be two things really close, be sure that you're using the right one. Um, and even if you are using the quote unquote right one, occasionally really large plugins have major vulnerabilities that might get exposed. So in the case of WooCommerce a few weeks ago, there was a, a really kind of funky thing that happened. Like a shop manager could inject a page uh, payload that deleted the plugin that turned a shop manager into an admin and then they could wreak havoc on a site. Kind of a crazy scenario, but it could have happened. So sometimes these things happen. So if you are reading the general tech news of things, um, wherever you get your news about technology and WordPress, read these sources closely because these things tend to get reported quite widely. Um, additionally, nothing is sacred. So uh, quite famously, a GDPR plugin a few weeks ago had a pretty major vulnerability found out. Um, so it's quite critical to test, read, and review. But just as Kevin said, tools don't do anything. It's about processes. Um, and in many cases, I would probably not recommend using this plugin. I'd recommend considering what's in WordPress core because we spent a lot of time unpacking that. Um, additionally, going one step further, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about performance across the WordPress ecosystem. Um, I'm not going to say who this was, but this happened right around GDPR. Uh, really kind of funny thing that happened. So this uh, publisher um, has a 30 second page load here and then a Lighthouse score, performance score of three, uh, which is bad if you don't know. Uh, so this is really bad. So May 25th comes around and in Europe, this is what happens. <laughs> they go up to 86 because they decided to stop doing that. And uh, a bunch of naysayers on Twitter were like, but that's just, I just have ad blockers. I don't see privacy things and I know what I'm doing. And well, no, in practice, because of server-side rendering and alternate layouts, this is what your site looks like with an ad blocker. It's still pretty bad. So a performance score of 11 and a 15, uh, or sorry, 21 second uh, load for interactivity. Like that's still not great. 
right? So in practice, you have to ask yourself, like, what does your actual thing overall mean? Um, and if you can argue for less, your users will actually get more out of your whole site. And if you have a manager who's like, ah, I don't care about this legal stuff or privacy, that, why are we spending so much time on this? Performance could be a pretty good argument too. Yeah. And as a whole, the way that we approach software development at XWP tends to think about performance as a key metric to user experience. So this is part of the angle that we take as we start to unpack the requirements for privacy. So you have an ecosystem in your site. What's going on? You should understand what that data means and whether you actually need to keep it. Um, so there's a couple of things that have happened over the last few months that you may not be aware of. Um, a lot of things that uh, you can do involve anonymization. Once you've collected data, you actually don't even need to keep that person's information lined up with that data set. So Google Analytics offers some automatic anonymization. Ad networks are starting to offer similar tools. And this means that you can keep some of this information in summary, but you don't actually expose any information. So if you leak a report or you share it with a third party, guess what? You don't break the law, potentially. Ask a lawyer. And these things are usually deep in the settings, but a lot more of them exist post-GDPR than existed pre-GDPR. Um, additionally, if you have no idea what's going on within your data sets, it's also going to be critical for you to probe those data sets. So if you've never once looked at your PHP My Admin settings, or you've never once unpacked what these things look like, do it. Um, if you haven't played with WPCLI, do it. It's a great project. Um, if you're using third-party integrations, which you probably are, you should be using tools to unpack what's actually inside those APIs, what you get on a response. You should understand all the endpoints available as you work with these third-party integrations. So data minimization in theory says that data safety is key and that data must be gathered approach, uh, appropriately, which sounds kind of cool, but in practice it means you just don't want to get stuff. You get the things you ultimately need, you get rid of the things you don't need. It means you have less transit, less performance concerns, and you just run through and, and live with a wonderfully more minimal approach. Um, speaking of minimal, uh, definitely don't do this. This is probably uh, the worst thing I've seen in the last few months. So um, someone just poking around uh, a website, uh, eBay's Japan site, um, was able to expose at ebay.co.jp slash dot git slash head the entire source code of eBay Japan. Um, this is because someone simply didn't follow coding best practices. They didn't include the .git file in their .git ignore file. It's really straightforward. They exposed all of the data as deployed to production in a deployment pipeline. So if you do have coding best practices, you should be checking on your own to make sure that what this stuff looks like, especially in the protect phase. The, the worst thing to do is to get through this entire life cycle and then end up with a banana you slip on. So WordPress core is only beginning probably for you. You probably also have third-party tools, marketing tools, ad scripts, CDNs, integrations, and all these other places where data might live. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, am I okay with how these things work? Do I understand how to use them? If someone asks me to remove stuff, do I understand how I actually can work with these tools? Uh, and if you're not comfortable with it, spend time doing the other steps we talked about to be able to become more confident. The core tools do get most sites, though, most of the way there. So before you go looking for other things, look at core tools first. They're quite good. Yeah. So uh, those core tools involve things like export, erasure, and hooks for plugins. Um, there's lots of documentation around uh, plugin developers and, core, and theme developers. Uh, there's also tools written for purely non-developers. So if you just have no idea what we're talking about up here, go look at the privacy docs that are available for WordPress core, because they do make it as simple as possible for non-developers. Uh, um, additionally, there's a bunch of things happening in the roadmap, things like multi-site support, localization support for sites who have a lot more complex setups, WPCLI support, as well as consent logging tools. Um, currently, a lot of the tools that people are using on top of WordPress core involve third-party tools for consent logging, but in the roadmap, we're going to start to have a lot of requirements that are built inside the database so we can track what privacy collection looks like up close. So that little checkbox thing that happens, that whole thing will be coming to core. Um, there's also identified, we've also identified a few things in the future that are happening that are going to be quite critical, things like CCPA. I know that Kevin is like, eh, it's not important to worry about. We think it's It critical. will be, eventually, maybe. <laughs> and we think it's critical to prepare as far ahead in, in time so that we don't have to rush close to it like we had to do for GDPR. Strong agree. So once you've done all of that, you need to document everything. Ideally, along the way, you need to keep this document living. You need to make sure it's up to date. And you need to make sure that you have stuff ready for people who might join your team, who might leave your team. Um, if you have one engineer leave, suddenly you like lose 30% of your company's knowledge. That shouldn't be the case. 
right? Ideally, you should be having a system in place that allows for collective knowledge and also exposure of the things that aren't right. And you respond to the things that aren't right, so you're, you're more comfortable, so that when you get into the next phase of the privacy lifecycle, you don't have to worry, right? You can go and say like, hey, Charlie, you should learn about privacy. I can train you. Look at this document. Let's walk through it together. You have systems to be able to monitor these things in real time. Um, you also have really the need at a high level to not worry about these things anymore. Um, you can start to think about these things as normal operations for your business and less about things that you have to respond to. Like no one likes fires that you have to put out, but data privacy doesn't have to be one of those things. So, okay, once you're all good, you're like, okay, we're all hanging out, training every, you know, once a quarter for privacy, and, you know, things are looking really good. Um, then you get, like, an email that says, hey, we gotta do something. Um, well, there, there are legal requirements or technical requirements of how you respond to those privacy pieces. This are, these are things like information requests, erasures, and corrections, as well as breach notices. So if something might happen, you need to be able to know what you're supposed to do, legally, uh, ethically probably, and technically. There, you have little things that you should be able to do to be able to respond to these things. So, um, Kevin, how bad was GDPR? How bad was it? Yeah, like what happened since GDPR? Oh, nothing, everything went smoothly. All the sites are perfect, right? Yeah, so since GDPR, we've had 27,000 reported data breaches. I think it's a huge deal. Uh, it's not small. <laughs> so that's, that's what's reported. There's probably more that are doing things. Like it's hard to write software. It's hard to write good software. It's hard to write perfect software. Software is full of bugs. Software is full of vulnerabilities. And this is a process. So what happens when you actually end up in the situation? Do you scramble? No, you're not supposed to scramble. You're supposed to be able to respond to this with a process. So in your assessment phase for a breach, you should define whether there is a breach, understand what that means legally based on your locality, based on your requirements federally, locally, and also understand the event that actually occurred. So if someone says something happened, understand what that actually means so you don't have to run and respond to it. And once that actually happens, you say, okay, there was a breach, this happened, someone's got data, or several people got data, or just it was exposed. You gotta figure out, was there harm? There might not be harm, you might not know if there was harm. And if there is harm, you should decide what you need to do to respond to it besides reporting. Additionally, if you're lucky, you might have things like safe harbors, you might have exemptions, you might have defenses, you might have encryption, right? SSL is a really good way to worry a little bit less, not a lot less, but a little bit less about some of the problems if someone is exposing uh, or, or worried about exposed data inside the whole piece. Um, additionally, if you uh, are in a locality, you're gonna have to ask this question around what your responsibility to notify people might be. So in the case of South Dakota, like 250 people information out there, you have to respond. In Colorado, it's 500. When you might have to respond is extremely different. So if you're in South Carolina, 72 hours. If you're in Louisiana, you can wait two months. Like, you don't have to do anything. We can take a holiday, come back, go to the beach. Go to Mardi Gras. Go to Mardi Gras, yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, oh yeah, by the way, we like leaked a bunch of people's email addresses. Like, no big deal, no big deal. Um, and as a whole, like that variance is gonna be quite challenging. So you don't necessarily need a lawyer today, tomorrow, next week, but you should definitely understand what you're doing. And if you have a data set, each of these localities that you're working with may have special requirements. So if you leak customer's data in California, you may be required to report it in South Carolina. Understanding what that actually means is where you might want to seek counsel. And the, the more sensitive your data, the more you have to be concerned about this. Exactly. So social security numbers, definitely a thing to be concerned about. Birthdays, definitely a thing to be consider, concerned about. Uh, someone's favorite you know, color, probably less worried, but you never know. Someone might say that might be a, a, a version of, of coded information or something else. So that's the life cycle. A lot of information, but it's pretty simple. You wanna understand things, you wanna to respond to them, you wanna make sure that you don't have anything happen to it, and uh, as you move through the sustained process, you really don't want to feel like anything is on fire. So ideally, you sit and sustain as long as possible, but as you need to, and you hear about things, you, in the sustained process, move back through, assess and protect. So Kevin. Uh, so what did we learn? Uh, hopefully a lot. Hopefully some of that stuck in. I know it's the end of the day. 
Uh, but we learned that um, US privacy and EU privacy laws have existed for decades and are continuing to evolve and there's a rising tide, so it's something we should all be concerned about. Um, and hopefully we've learned that you need to integrate best privacy practices into all of your workflows and uh, plan and review these things continually. And if all this made sense to you, if you're like, hey, great, I got all this old news, fellas, like, please join Core and help us write better privacy tools um, that will uh, be useful for millions of people all over the world. Um, and it's just going to be a continually growing need over the years. So check it out. Uh, more people make more better software. And of course, I'm going to call back out the principles that Kevin had mentioned earlier. It's important to be transparent. It's important to collect little data. It's important not to store things that you don't need. It's important to keep your data safe. It's important to be accountable. It's important to write stuff down. I promise that's probably about that simple. Oh yeah, easy peasy, right? And uh, most importantly, you don't attain compliance, you maintain compliance. Uh, so with that, we'll take any questions in the few minutes we have left if your brain isn't totally melted. Yeah, yeah, yeah and step right up to the mics so that live stream uh, can hear us. Um, you talked about uh, WordPress core tools and all that. Do you know if uh, the privacy team on WordPress has anything planned for like cookie policies and stuff like that? Yeah, we spend a, a little bit, uh, really briefly in that slide about core, talking a little bit about this. Um, it is on the roadmap. Um, we have some competing priorities because people have a lot of opinions on what we should do next. So if you're interested, uh, at Contributor Day, I'll, I'll be talking about privacy. Come find me and we can talk. And if you're using some tools that collect a lot of cookies, like say Jetpack, um, like Jetpack has a cookie policy builder that you can use. Um, and hopefully we'll see more of those, not just in core, but with um, all of the big tools that people use in WordPress. Hey, um, this is not a philosophy talk, so I know that this might be out of scope, but I was just curious, like, if you could go into a little bit more about what you see as the conflict between free speech and privacy, and like why, why you presented it as that kind of dichotomy. So this is a, a common framework within how people talk about privacy in the United States. We tend not to prioritize priority, uh, privacy. Um, in practice, we need to prioritize both. So I think free speech is just as important. Uh, I went to journalism school, I've worked in publications, I care about the topic of free speech probably even more than I care about privacy and I like privacy a lot. Um, as a whole, what we need to do is to protect the space of free speech. It's why I work in WordPress, it's why I think we all work in WordPress to an extent. Um, and I think we need to continue to democratize publishing and whatever that means. So what makes WordPress better, I think at a core level, are things like privacy tools, are things like exposure of information of how these things actually work. It's training, it's keeping things in basic simple language, it's documentation, it's, pr it's preaching the stuff up here on my soapbox. Hopefully it's not a soapbox. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's at the end of the day, it's hopefully getting you just as excited about the same exact things that I'm excited about. And hopefully you incorporating this into your agency workflows or your, your personal sites, telling your own local meetups, telling your own local work camps, and hopefully making an actual impact that changes the things we really care about. Um, but yeah, like definitions of what's personal and what's private and what's um, you know, public interest uh, and what's speech uh, vary. But like the GDPR tried very hard to grapple with that and the people who wrote it. There's a lot in there about exceptions for public interest in, in journalism that it's about personal control and not about censorship, but it's a question we're gonna have to continually answering. They're not in conflict necessarily directly, but they do definitely overlap and bounce back and forth. So. Yeah, and calling it out, there are quite a few questions around who GDPR and CCPA serve and how the lobby structures work. And it's messy, like this is not a simple topic. And if it's something that really affects you, I'd say unpack, ask the questions, try to learn about what the big companies are doing, what the small companies are doing, and what the actual responsibilities are. Question over here. Ian, um, do you have any resources for setting cookie policies that, that we could go look at to set our own cookie policies? For instance, I'm just about ready to release a plugin that sets two cookies with utterly anonymized information about <clears throat> a user generically. Nothing in any way relates back to the user, no IPs, no nothing, just to record when they viewed the site. And if another person uses their browser, it would act as if they were <clears throat> the first person. And I need to know, do I need to, to set some policies about this cookie usage? And I have no idea where to go look. That, that's a good question. Um, 
to not get into uh, specific legal right. advice here is hard. Uh, but in general, like the more anonymous your data is, the fewer requirements you have for things like you know opt-in and checkboxes and things in the EU. Um, but it will definitely help you to write the things down, um, mm -hmm. and that will also um, will be something that your users of your plugin are probably looking for. It's like, hey, what are these cookies? Exactly. And if you can then honestly you say, hey, like we only know the browser fingerprint, then it's good to say that publicly somewhere. Okay. Uh, and additionally, sometimes there are things like shadow data, so recording times might actually indicate when someone logs into a profile. That might be useful for someone, that could be exposure. Understanding that data means something more is also quite critical. Yeah. And I think we have time for one last question and we need to wrap up. Um, so I'm coming at this a little sideways. I work for a web accessibility company and you know the parallels between awesome. privacy, thank you, and accessibility are always very striking. I mean, <clears throat> listening to the presentation, I was just like, Yes, but um, you know, and in the accessibility community, we like to make the parallel because we assume that, of course, everybody accepts that privacy and security, like you have to do that. And but you know, you had the example of if your manager doesn't think it's important, or you know, in the U.S., we don't really care about it so much. I mean, do you find that that's the case? That that convincing people to get behind these practices is kind of a struggle. It depends. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is like the key driver for so many people. Like there's like, if I am a small business or I'm an agency and a client comes to me and says, I have X dollars or like this is what I need or maybe I'm working for that company directly, which I've done in the past. And they say, we only have this time on a roadmap. What do we do? And they say, we want to make more money. That's what they always say. But making more money doesn't do anything, right? The question is, what value will you ultimately deliver to a user? Like making money doesn't mean anything. The question is what will actually do the things that really move the needle. So if you're talking about performance, right, like this, I mentioned this mm -hmm. earlier, yeah. performance is a topic that we tend to lead with, but along the way we say, why do you really need to collect this data? It's silly. Like it's not really going to help your users. It's going to make you become the slowest site in your vertical. Um, in the case of accessibility, as you would know quite yeah, you know, mm -hmm. dramatically, if you have all of the requirements for WCAG, you rank much higher. Google also indicates that when you follow these things, you rank much higher as well. Right. So I usually lean uh, quite heavily on positioning and ranking as part of the, the factoring, performance as part of the factoring. And also, like at the end of the day, ethically, we don't right. need our websites to suck. Like We really don't. And we have the opportunity to argue for the things we care about. And if we do it by design, it won't be that way by, mm -hmm. by design. Sure. Um, yeah, and I think um, yeah, there's always like a bare minimum you could do to just kind of get by on accessibility or privacy. Um, but I think um, early investment means that like iterating is really easy and really cheap. Um, so, um, and I think for a lot of firms, like the GDPR has been clarifying. It's like, oh, let's really like dive deep on compliance here, and so that the next thing will be less. And I think um, if you're just kind of like doing the minimum, you're just kind of like floating by and reacting. That can actually like slowly be like a big time suck. And so, you know, if you have the time, of course, you know. Time is in short supply at startups and things. But uh, if you have the time, like if you can make an early investment in these things, it, it, it pays dividends for years. Uh, and it's funny because the amount of times I've heard of someone saying, I heard about Section 508 and I need to do accessibility stuff. Yeah. Oh my God, everything's on fire. I'm like, well, you know, you've always had to do that. You just aren't following the rules. Right. Additionally, like you've always had to follow Span Cam. You've always had to follow FERPA if you work in education. You've always had to follow HIPAA if you work in health. Like this stuff is the law. So once someone finally realizes it's the law, they usually respond to it quite clearly and it becomes that highest value business priority mm -hmm. because shutting down your doors because you're breaking the law is much worse than not making more money. Sure. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming and caring.